Hello, everyone. Welcome and thank you for tuning in for Sea Alaska Heritage Institute's August First Friday Q&A with our virtual artist in resident. My name is Jay Zeller. I work at SHI, and it is my pleasure to introduce Stacy Williams, a Klingit native born into the Raven side of the Teixeira under the Dog Salmon Clan, raised in Ketchikan, Alaska. It's also where she continues to practice her arts and teaching. Student under Holly Churchill, Dorcia Jackson, Diane Douglas Willard, and many other talented weavers, she's worked hard to study multiple disciplines of weaving. As an instructor, she instills hope in each of her students that the arts will go on, as well as works to maintain the delicate balance of traditional knowledge and contemporary growth of the culture. Her baskets and pieces can be seen on display in the Ketch Can Museum collection, as well as Crazy Wolf Studios and in private collections. Stacy's artwork can soon also be purchased in the Sea Alaska Heritage Store online. All purchases support both the artist and SHI art programming that helps the community and keeps our ancient art practices alive. If you have any questions, please type them into the comments and I'll read them off to our guests. Stacy, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Jay. It is a pleasure to be speaking with you today. I'd like to acknowledge that in this virtual setting, I am speaking and sharing from Ketchikan, Alaska, the traditional homelands of the Sanyukwan and the Tantaquan people. My name is Stacy Williams, and I am Clinket of the Raven Dog Salmon under teachers Holly Churchill, Dorka Jackson, and Diane Douglas Willard. My home has always been right here in Ketchikan, and it's where I plan to stay. Shall we dive in? Let's dive in. Our first question of the day is, what made you become an artist and how long have you been one? I would say that most people start off as artists and it's more of a question of what did they narrow their art form down to and how much do they still practice it? I believe I started beadwork before I was about 10 years old and I continued on into native arts class while in high school. I'd like to recognize that teacher for a moment, Barbara Pierce, who was the Alaska Native Studies instructor at Ketchikan High School the years that I attended. I wasn't in her roster all four years, but I remember being her student for that long. While in high school, I also took a spring break weaving course from Holly Churchill for the first time. And several years later, I returned to work at the same museum where she hosted that class and was able to continue a relationship on with her. Awesome. What is your favorite thing about your art form and have you considered other art forms? At the moment, I mostly consider myself a weaver, but I have uh, dabbled in carving. I've been successful at beadwork and even tried out some skin and fur sewing. Um, some teachers do recommend focusing on one art form at a time, but I've found for me that I enjoy a break every now and again. You know, sometimes going into a project, you have an idea about how it should turn out. Uh, but don't necessarily see the, the full path that is going to get you there. What I enjoy about working in different mediums is that you can reveal more than one path to a destination. And sometimes those different mediums will complement each other, you know, such as putting fur on a headband or around a hat or, you know, incorporating different styles of textiles, you know, things like that. That's awesome. Um, what was the first thing you weaved with? What was the first thing I wove with? I remember being very little and at my aunt's house and we were preparing for a feast. I don't necessarily remember the food or what the feast was about, but I remember sitting in the living room making cedar bark roses for quite a long time. Little ones that you put in your hair. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, we have our first comment question of the night. Uh, is there a weaving project that you would love to be able to undertake in the future? Oh, yes, absolutely. Uh, my biggest aspiration, I think, is to be able to make a robe um, with textiles. Raven's Tail or Chill Cat, not sure which one's going to come first, but, you know, maybe they'll actually happen simultaneously. I do have a full-size loom now. Uh, which is very, very awesome. I'm very excited to uh, to have that in my collection to be able to just get going on that. So now all there is is time to spin the warp. All right, my next question is, um, what primary materials do you work with right now? 
Right now, I primarily work with red and yellow cedar. Uh, those are my go-to for making baskets. Uh, merino or goat wool or boiled cedar, yellow cedar for chill cat, uh, merino wool for raven's tail. I also use the root of the spruce tree for weaving, um, though I haven't gotten as far with the spruce trees as, as I'd like to. Uh, those who uh, work with roots will understand that it takes quite a bit more time to gather those roots and being here in Ketchikan, it's not as available. Uh, so I do have to go off island usually to try to find a good, a good spruce root grove. And it'll take, I mean, I don't know, probably at least four times as much time to gather the roots to do the same project that I would with cedar. So practice with cedar for now, uh, spruce root for those much, much finer projects. Another common question is, what is your favorite piece to make or work on? Ooh, I think I really at the moment am uh, digging into utilitarian baskets. Uh, I have several on display out in the world at the moment. Um, one at the Ketchikan Museum's Totem Heritage Center is called uh, Spiral, and that one can be viewed on, on their website, and they put a nice little... Um, video uh, uh, with the basket circling so you can kind of get a good feel of it. But a utilitarian basket will have its warps uh, added to the, the bottom of it and turned inside out so that those warps are what hit the rocks on the beach or the, you know, the forest floor while you're trying to gather. And so it's a, it's a very special type of basket, uh, one that my, my teacher Holly Churchill worked with me for quite some time to really learn the, the foundation, foundational aspects of it. Uh, but utilitarian baskets, those are kind of, those are my thing right now. <laughs> I just finished one this week. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. How long on average does it take you to complete a piece? Ooh, well, <clears throat> that, that can really vary, um, especially when not a lot of people will take into consideration the amount of time that it takes to harvest and process the material. So I like to factor that in. So whereas a, a basket could be woven you know, within a week or two or even a several days, depending on the size, it's gonna take you two or three times that amount of time just to be able to get that material prepped so fine to work with. Do you work in silence or do you need something playing in the background? That'll depend on the day. And of course, what I'm working on, if there's something really, uh, I don't know, intense, like, you know, a, a four-way braid, or maybe I've got, you know, I'm working on my chill cat and I've got several sets of braids in the same uh, area, then I'm, I might want a little bit of quiet. Um, I was talking to you earlier, I have my dogs and they're not very quiet, so I've got to deal with that. But, you know, sometimes we'll just have a little bit of TV in the background or maybe some music, but usually something that you've seen before, so it's not too distracting. I understand that. <laughs> what is uh, your proudest piece to date? Proudest piece to date? Uh, well, I think I'm actually wearing it. Um, my, my cedar hat, um, I'll go ahead and duck down for a minute in front of the, the window here. Um, this piece is um, a little bit further back in terms of what I've created. Uh, However, the lessons that went into it, the amount of support that I had from friends and families and family, and of course my mentor, um, you know, it, it truly was a, a special piece of work. It also took quite a bit more time than it's supposed to. Uh, I had an area where uh, they, they say your fingers will fly for a bit and you'll just get so much work done in such a small amount of time. And I had gotten probably about an inch and a half into my hat uh, down on the uh, right about in this area, <laughs> inch and a half right about there. And I had to take it all out. About probably eight or nine hours worth of work just had to come out. And after that, it stung for a bit. But, you know, I took a break came back to it with fresh eyes and was able to execute the design the way that it was meant to be executed and not in the, you know, a more manipulated way. <laughs> Speaking of uh, your mentors, you've had quite a few. Can you tell me what the most valuable lesson each of them taught you? Most valuable lesson. 
Uh, well, there, I think I'd start with uh, Diane Douglas Willard. Um, she really taught me patience. And by that, I mean the patience to work with really small pieces to make uh, jewelry type items like uh, earrings or to do fine uh, techniques like false embroidery with grass on baskets. Uh, I believe that she gave me my first piece of grass to work with and it went into my fourth basket. Uh, she gave me a little bit more grass and it went into my very first um, miniature basket, which is about um, probably about that tall. Um, just a very, very small basket. I used a, a small brown medicine bottle to, to weave around. Uh, and then I, I had the, actually, you know what, I wonder, it's probably around here somewhere. Well, we'll get to that later if we come back to it, somebody wants to see it. Uh, but you know, the false embroidery techniques I would say that a lot of people can struggle with it, especially at first, and then find their groove. Um, but with working with Diane, I found that um, the patience that she had for the material and what it was teaching her and what it was teaching me, it was just wonderful. Um, Holly Churchill taught me how to um, use a, um, a critique on yourself um, that you know she would teach me how to look at my work and see where it needed to be improved rather than her just telling me what needs to be improved and i think that's a really important lesson for a lot of young artists to take upon themselves is to be able to critique their own work you know it's not a bad thing it's a growth tool uh, you know it's important that when the teacher's not around that you still correct your mistakes and take them out if need be and Dorica Jackson, well, you know, she taught me the, the true core of encouragement to, you know, to believe in yourself, to recognize effort and improvement, and to really always have confidence in yourself. She always believed that I could take on the finer techniques of Chilkat, and hey, I believe her. I've done a couple pieces now, and I look forward to doing a couple pieces with her in the future, and I look forward to, you know, striking out on my own and being able to, to really take on the challenge. Um, I, I won't say by myself, because you always have your support and, you know, you always have your mentors, um, but to really the to take the charge on that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, speaking of uh, your small basket, uh, we got a question. What is the smallest piece you've ever made? Oh, I think I just uh, did it last week. I was uh, doing a small uh, spruce root basket and I can't even fit my needle on the inside of it. Um, it is a large blunt eye needle and I, um, you know, it's um, probably, I want to say about that tall and it's just, it's, it's very, very, very small, uh, though not as small as some other weavings I've seen, you know, some people out there, you know, I was checking out the blueberry gallery uh, that's going on this weekend and there's an artist in there that made some very wonderful spruce root earrings. So there's, there's small things that you can make out there. You just have to, again, have the, the patience and the encouragement to do it and the critique. <laughs> I love tiny things. Um, <laughs> What would you say is uh, your biggest inspiration for your artwork? My biggest inspiration, you know, I'd really say my students. Um, as an educator, while being a student myself, um, it's really encouraging that my, my students are always there for me to learn as well. Uh, I have uh, three uh, three students in particular that I worked with in a homeschool family um, and two of them are still around and one has uh, flown the coop as they would say but uh, you know she's struck off on her own and has a has a life and still wants to continue weaving and the other two that are still in school they want to continue weaving uh, you know they and they're so young you know <laughs> and they started out so young and they talk about how they are not as proud of their first pieces as they are of their most recent pieces, uh, but they understand that that could change in several years when they see how far they've come. So truly, you know, those, those students that you work with, uh, they should really inspire you to always grow. When I don't have an answer, they're like, all right, well, we'll see you next week when you, when you find it out. A lot of faith. Um, <laughs> Speaking of uh, you being a teacher, as an educator, can you tell us what it's like teaching your art form? 
Ooh, uh, well, the best moment in each class is I would say it, I call it the click when each student, you know, when they get what they're supposed to be doing, the switch has flipped until that moment, it can feel like an uphill battle. But after it's a very long slide back down, what I see more often than not is that the dynamic of the classroom will also change and in a very positive way. On the first day, students, you know, particularly in elementary, can be timid and unsure uh, of the new project that's in their hands. But once that switch flips and something clicks, there's so much encouragement and it's going around and it hardly feels like teaching anymore. It's just really a, a group of people sharing an art form. Um, my next question is, uh, why do you think art is important for our culture and how has it helped you connect to it? Well, art is really a defining point where we are a thriving culture. You know, for me, the connection is the origin of the art. I don't mean when it started, but more with what. Uh, you know, the bark from the red cedar tree, the root of the spruce tree, the rounds of the alder, the skin of an animal, you know, I would give thanks for all the materials that are that are provided to me by nature. And my connection to that is, you know, every time I sit down with a piece, I have that thanks in my mind of where did I get this tree, you know how much did I learn from that tree I'm always telling my tree that it's, you know i'm, I'm going to learn from it. Um, and that's a really special relationship to have when you are um, able to go go out and have that knowledge of how to how to get those resources. Do you have any advice for aspiring artists and what is a lesson that you wish you had learned starting out? Always look for the opportunity to learn. <laughs> not every mentor will be the best fit and sometimes the best mentor isn't available but there is a lesson around every corner and in every stitch that must be taken out um, sometimes the lesson is clear and readable sometimes the lesson is simply patience the lesson I wish I'd learned was to try if it doesn't work out that can sometimes be a bummer but you won't know until you try Uh, how do you use uh, social social media to promote your artwork and what was uh, the first time that you used it? Can you tell us the story? Oh, well, everybody kind of has a Facebook page, right? I guess that's where we are at. <laughs> and those who don't have it, maybe they'll want to get on and see. Uh, but first, you know, I do have my personal page uh, where I do share some of my artwork, but most of my artwork has been moved over to my artist page, which is under Stacy Williams, comma, Weaver. Uh, I also have a website at stacywilliamsweaver.com. I tend to be a bit more active on the page than with the website, but I make sure to update both periodically. And uh, I just recently joined Instagram, which uh, that'll be, that's fun. There's a lot of art on there that I see locally around town from Ketchikan and um, that's, that's really fun. So, you know, I put some of my art out there and, you know, maybe it'll inspire somebody else to do some art too. Um, back to the size of pieces question, what's the largest piece you've ever made? The largest piece I ever made is in a private uh, collection at the moment um, and is, well, the base of it was a five gallon bucket size. Um, I did not weave it all the way up the side as that would proportionally be um, a little bit difficult with the with the cedar bark. Uh, maybe I, you know, someday uh, I'll do it a little bit differently. But the uh, the basket is, you know, five gallon bucket size, and then at least, um, you know, however many inches or foot and a half. I'm I'm really not sure how big it is. It's probably about half the size of the actual bucket itself. Um, but hey, it's on my page. <laughs> you can go check it out. It's a a, a large. Uh, uh, gathering style basket, uh, which means that it does have the, the more open style of weaving. And I used a boiled yellow cedar strap uh, for, um, for the handles. Uh, so that's pretty nice, but uh, yeah, 
Uh, besides that, I'd also say that the next contender would be a strongman or warrior's rope that I made only because of the sheer amount of cedar that you have to use for such a project. Um, I probably used as much cedar in, in, both, of, in both of those projects because the warrior rope will, it goes all the way across your body and um, it's uh, quite a large item. All right, our next question is uh, it's a common question. Processing spruce roots, spruce roots can be a frustrating process. What advice would you give someone who is feeling defeated and frustrated? Oh, okay. So for spruce roots, um, from my understanding, is that in the, the basic harvesting is to, you know, go out and get your root, but uh, to be very choosy. Um, this isn't, you know, just to grab every root that you can find, but to grab the roots that are long and straight and don't have too many um, roots coming off of them. Uh, you want to find a root that you are comfortable working with which that'll you know come later so it's kind of like which comes first the chicken or the egg which comes first do you find out if you're comfortable with this size or do you get that size what i recommend is getting the size of a um no bigger than a pencil and definitely don't go for the dental floss at first because that will typically snap um, you'll want to have two different sizes of sticks to be able to process. And when you process, you, you want to have harvested your roots and keep them in a bag to keep them all moist. Then you have to go through the cooking process and wear, you know, the leather gloves while you are pulling them through the stick. Uh, but most people it's in finding the tool that you're comfortable with. If you're feeling pretty defeated, I am wondering if you're working alone or if you have um, hopefully a partner that can help you is one doing the cooking and then one getting the bark off. That's um, truly how it was meant to be is that this wasn't in the early days, this wasn't a process that was done in solitary, you know, this was a process that was done in a group. Um, so you really want to have at least one more supportive person, even if all they can do is, you know, put them in the fire real quick and then hand them over so you can split them. And then again, put them back into a clean bag, uh, not the same bag, but into a clean bag, wrap them up until later that night or afternoon that you're going to be able to cut them open and make sure you have them at least have them all the way through, at least on that first time around. And then you can go back and you can, you know, split them down further, but having a whole root sit overnight and get all the way dry, it's not gonna, it's not gonna, you know, go as well. The great thing is that spruce root groves can be found, you know, over Juno and, you know, in Yakutad, you know, places like that and things, but, um, you know, find a good grove, treat it well, and, you know, have a partner. Would you say that uh, weaving is definitely something you should do more in a group? Um, a lot of the weavers that I see, uh, or at least not, not all of them, I, I have seen quite a few who weave in groups, but especially in the aftermath of this pandemic, a lot of people have been isolated and not comfortable weaving or being together in groups. So would you say that um, it's a process that should benefits more in a group than than by by yourself like a lot of art you can do uh on your own uh, in 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 solitude whether it's carving or painting or drawing or sewing um but it seems to me like you're you're saying that the weaving is something that is more for a community aspect than just uh, a personal expression of our work. I didn't really ask a question, but <laughs> that's what you made me think about. I, I get what you're saying, but um, you know, most definitely in those times that it is appropriate to be working in a group, um, definitely take advantage of that. Um, if you can, you know, keep your bubble small, of course, and you know, have that one or two people that you're with, um, you know. Some things are easier when you have more than one. 
However, if you are working by yourself, um, I do recommend at least reaching out, if not, you know, just virtually for those forms of encouragement, um, those forms of praise, those forms that, you know, lift you up um, from the people that are in your bubble, but maybe not on the inside, <laughs> you know, that those people that are just right outside knocking on the door, but you know, or, or maybe not knocking on the door, but I should say waving through the window politely, respectfully. <laughs> uh, but that, you know, I, when the pandemic first hit, I know that there was a lot of weavers that were just felt stranded. And what I found was that we ended up zooming. We got on zoom and, wove together in large groups, in small groups, in one-on-one -on -one groups. And that support is truly important. Um, there are some weavers out there that, you know, I'm, I won't call them out, <laughs> but, uh, you know, that they support me in a way that I'm not sure that they fully understand just by, you know, saying, oh, hey, look, you got that done, or how's that piece going, or, I haven't heard from you in a while. Are you busy creating or are you sitting in a slump? You know, reaching out, that's what you can do. And there's lots of Facebook groups, you know, that people are reaching out all the time, just like, oh, hey, this is where I'm at. And, you know, if you want to Zoom, if you're not too close or if you want to meet up, if you are, you know, it's a, it's a truly great thing. And I think actually that this pandemic has opened is that you can reach out to so many more people that aren't just within your immediate reach. Uh, that, you know, I have friends, you know, in Juneau, I have friends over in Metlakatla, you know, I have friends down in Washington or California, Nevada, um, you know, there's a lot of ways to be able to reach out and to have that, have that support. That's great advice. Um, a follow-up uh, on the, the root question is, uh, do you have experience dyeing your materials? And if so, what was your experience like? Ooh. Um, I have only really worked with artificial dyes. I haven't um, gotten too far into the natural dyes, which it's kind of a similar thing of, you know, the carvers will say, well, I'm not going to use a handsaw for everything. You know, they might pull out the bandsaw or the planer or, you know, whatever it is, whatever power tool it is that they're doing to get to that point to be able to work on what's important. Um, you know, some people do have um, experience in doing those natural dyes, and I look for their classes every time that they come out, and oh darn, I'm not in the same town, or it's, you know, not on Zoom or things like that, but, um, you know, the, the natural dye classes are certainly something to get in on what, when you can. However, if you can't get in on a natural dye class, you know, go to the store and get some dye, read the directions, and follow them as best you can, adjust as necessary, uh, do small batches at first, you know, just a couple pieces of cedar to see how it works out, scraps if you need to, um, and just see how it turns out. Um, you know, does it become brittle? Does it bleed? Do you need to rinse it more? Do you need to set it more? Um, you know, fixatives are an important thing as well to, to use sometimes, but I've mostly had a trial and error sort of uh, situation with, with dyeing materials. Um, I've never dyed my spruce root. Um, I do prefer it to be nice and clean and bright um, because that is very hard to get to <laughs> in the first place. So then I don't wanna change its color, um, but I have dyed my cedar. I have dyed my canary grass, um, uh, both my red and my yellow cedar I've dyed. And you know, it just, it depends on what you're working with. What I find is that when I dye the colors, um, very vibrant or differently for my elementary students, it's easier for them to understand the weaving. That the red goes over, the black goes back. Now the black goes over and the red goes back. You know, you make a little rhyme out of it. I didn't mean to, but it, it happens. <laughs> hey, that works. Rhyming, there's a reason why rhyming is so catchy. <laughs> Sticks in the brain. Um, our next question is, uh, where is your favorite place to work and what is the most comfortable place? Uh, the most comfortable place is usually the most open place. <laughs> I tend to have projects spread out throughout the house. Uh, you know, uh, recently purchased a home and have a studio, uh, which is where I'm at right now. Um, I'm going to move my head and kind of get the glare of the light a little bit, but um, behind me is some of my um, 
shelving units that have um, the labels on them of what goes in them and helps keep me organized. Um, helps, but doesn't isn't foolproof. <laughs> so the projects do end up in different places. Uh, you know, if I'm working on fur, I tend to do that in the middle of the living room where there isn't a rug um, and am able to sweep up if I can't work outside because it's always raining because it's sketch can. Uh, but, <laughs> you know, I work in the studio. Sometimes I just am sewing in bed. Sometimes I'm weaving on the couch. It's kind of wherever's clever. All right, we are at a halfway point. So if you just tuned in, we are talking with Stacy Williams discussing her weaving and her journey as an artist. If you have questions, please type them into the comments and I'll read them off. Also, I'm about to put in some links in the comment section. Um, SHI has started construction of its art campus in downtown Juno, which will expand opportunities for education and art. If you're interested in making a donation to the art campus, please visit the website that I'm about to put into the comment section. Um, we are also still accepting uh, virtual artists and resident applications for the upcoming months. If you'd like to be featured, please apply. You can apply at the link again, I'm going to put in the comment section. Um, and then also, I'm also going to be putting in Stacy's own website um, where she has been hosting her work. So let me just do that real quick. Takes me a second. Do you have any pieces uh, near you right now, Stacy, that you can show us? Ooh, um, I have a, um, a Ravenstill pouch that I made. Um, it's got, it's a cute little, you can kind of see the snow pattern. It's got the little fringes, a sea otter on the top and then a boiled yellow cedar cordage for the strap, uh, which I also put uh, the little tie on the end where you can make it adjustable. Um, so that's, you know, that's a fun little thing. Um, I have another piece that um, uh, one teacher I didn't mention earlier, um, who I, I did take a class with uh, a, a few years ago. <laughs> um, and, you know, of course, during this, uh, you know, all of this, you know, business going on out in the world, there was, uh, you know, there's a lot of things going on. So I, the project didn't get finished is what I'm getting at, um, but I'm very proud of the weaving. I have to put the strap on it still is all I gotta do. Um, but there's this uh, uh, weaving and then it has a bottom and then it turns around and same on the other side. Um, so this was a special project that I did with uh, Catherine Rousseau in a class um, that we did down at Ketchikan Indian Community. Um, and there's uh, several other weavers in town that are the proud owners of a similar pouch. Um, I, good luck to them. I hope they all got theirs finished too. <laughs> um, and then also I wonder, I might have, I think I have, oh, here it is. Here's one of my baskets um, that uh, uh, has a wild strawberry pattern and then a potlatch ring um, as part of it. And it's got little blueberries inside. Um, actually, I think that little basket that I was talking about earlier is in there. Oh, hey, look, there it is. Um, so this is the first, um, the first miniature basket that I made uh, with false embroidery. So not only was it my first false embroidery, but it was also my first miniature. <laughs> So that was a lot of fun and it has a little a little plated bottom. So yeah, little fits on your finger. It's about as big that as is it adorable. Is. <laughs> Thank you. I usually uh, wear it around on a necklace, um, but over the years it has dried out a little bit. Um, and so it's gotten um, bigger on the form because uh, it has more room. So I worry about it falling off and I don't want to, well, I don't want to like put a string on it or anything. So I just, I just keep it there and I look at it sometimes and think of, you know, all those good times I had while <laughs> trying to make it. You've mentioned that uh, as a weaving community, you've discovered how to zoom and weave together still, even from a distance. Um, and you did mention that you had a project that didn't finish, but are there any projects that you were able to do or complete because of the pandemic, because of the quarantine? Like, did you have more time to do it because you couldn't really go out in the world? 
<laughs> well, I'd say that's actually probably where my uh, most of my media has come in is that, you know, I was able to create the website myself. Um, that's also uh, where I, I do have a Gmail at that address too. So the Stacy Williams Weaver at gmail.com. Um, if you did want to get in touch for any reason, and that's also on the website at Stacy Williams Weaver um, at whatever that is, the dot com. Uh, so, you know, we, you got it in the in the link in there. So that's awesome. Um, you can see a selection of my work. Um, and uh, quite a few of those pieces were created uh, during the pandemic times. Um, the one that I mentioned earlier, the five gallon uh, bucket basket, um, that one was created during pandemic times. Um, but yeah, a lot of the media and, you know, getting um, some of the, the bark harvested, um, you know, the, the rooting, um, the spruce rooting, you can, you, you know, I did recommend having another person. Um, bark harvesting, you can also, you know, go alone, um, not recommended, um, but, you know, it, it is feasible. Um, I always have my partner with me. Um, my lovely wife, uh, she goes out with me and helps me get the, gets the bark off the tree and we work together and um, that's just how it goes. So I'd say quite a bit of harvesting was done quite a bit of processing, um, but I also bought a house over the winter, so we had to move everything. Um, so, <laughs> you know, there's there's a lot, there's always something to be done. I was just talking earlier that if you're an artist out there and you think you have some downtime, you don't. You need to be working on that website, working on the resume, the artist statement, the bio, whatever it is, look at the last time you updated it, update it today. Here's your inspiration. Very solid advice. Um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, making your website? Because that is something that is definitely more needed for artists uh, as we enter more and more into a digital era, especially this past year. Um, what uh, what process did you? How did you? How did you get the process of having a website? Well, I had a friend recommend to me a free website builder. Um, once I got a little bit more comfortable with the website builder and actually had something that I was ready to really go out to the world, I paid for the, you know, the premium plan that gets you your own domain. So it's not at a crazy long link. Um, so what I would recommend is to break it down into steps. You know, what are you going to put on the website? What is your content? That's kind of the first place to start at is getting those photos. Uh, you know, I do all of my own photography for the most part. Um, there are, you know, several, you know, I don't take the pictures of myself. Uh, my headshots were, were done by the, the homeschool families. Uh, um, the mom is a photographer, Melina Glover at Mama Bird Studio. Um, but she um, takes my photos and then, you know, I take my photos of my work. And, um, you know, once you have your content, then you can start looking at, well, how are you going to display it? What do you think should come first? Um, I have my bio displayed, you know, a little bit about me. Why are you here? Who are you looking at? I have a, a quote uh, from, I, I call it a wise weaver, is that weaving belongs to us all. And I think that's really important to remember um, as you start getting into basketry or maybe you start re-looking at your relationship with basketry, is that weaving does belong to us all, no matter what um, background you have, wherever you come from, there is some sort of weaving uh, in that found, you know, however many thousands of years ago it may have been, there's still weaving in there. Um, with the, going back to the photos though, what I highly, highly recommend is getting some sort of backdrop, getting some sort of photo box. Um, you can pick them up on Amazon or at various websites for you know, less than 100 bucks, sometimes less than 50, and sometimes they even come with the lights. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, I have a, I have two different photo boxes I use. Um, one is uh, fairly large, but it folds up to be the size of a uh, just a large portfolio. Um, so then it just pops up together. Put your piece in, um, take a picture, and that's that. Uh, the best thing to do is always to get the the photo that doesn't need as much editing. You know, it can be okay to have to crop the image. Um, you know, maybe you need to rotate it a little bit, but when you get into trying to change, you know, the, the detailing or you try to change the sharpness, things like that, the color, um, that's where things can get a bit sticky and you're not necessarily representing the artwork um, that you're trying to do anymore. 
Um, so photos are really, really important. Next, you need descriptions. What is the photo of? Not everybody that scrolls across your website is going to understand um, what they're looking at. <laughs> so when you go onto my website and you look at the photos, you can click on the photos and then they will have descriptions pop up. So that's a nice feature of the website that I use, uh, which is wix.com. So wix.com is where you can get started with the free website builder. There's plenty of other free website builders out there. Uh, this was just the first one I tried and it was the first one I liked. <laughs> so that's where I went with it. Um, next, you know, get some feedback. You are not the person that you're making this website for. So get the feedback from, you know, from a friend, from a family member, try to get someone who's more of an acquaintance. So they're not just, you know, like, oh, so happy for you and don't necessarily look at the finer details of what needs to be changed, you know, get that honest feedback. And then finally, circle back. What do you think of what you've created? Put in that self critique, but also have some encouragement for yourself because you got this far, make it wide. I mean, you know, publish it, make it live. You don't necessarily have to give anybody the website yet, <laughs> but make it live. <laughs> that is great advice. Um, we have a couple more questions here in our comments. Uh, let me see here. How much time goes into harvesting various materials and uh, also what time of year is best for them? Oh, that can change. The time of year can change depending on how far north or south you are. Um, along the coast, you know, I know there are people down in um, Washington and Oregon that their cedar bark harvesting time is quite a bit, um, quite a bit different than ours. It's also going to depend on the weather. So you really need to be watching the clouds. You need to be watching the temperature. When the temperature hits correctly, um, which is not often, um, you're going to have a really great day out harvesting. If the weather isn't cooperating and the temperature isn't right, it's just not gonna go so well. Maybe you just need to go out and get some ice cream instead. <laughs> so for cedar bark harvesting, uh, we usually say to start looking at cedar trees, not necessarily harvesting, but to start looking at them on or around Mother's Day. You know, there's a lot of weavers that don't go out harvesting at all until after, after Mother's Day. Again, it depends on where you're at along, along the coast. Uh, bark will be good um, depending on which tree you're going for. Bark will be good for, you know, a month, maybe two, maybe longer depending on the season. Um, there are, you know, those that say that there can be a second season, um, you know, depending again on the weather. Uh, we've had some quite uh, interesting changes over the last, you know, few years that I've seen with, you know, how long it will stay warm, uh, which can make your bark mold or it can uh, be too cold in which your bark isn't gonna wanna come off the tree because the tree is cold. Um, for spruce rooting, you really wanna get in there after a good rain. That's what I would say in the summertime is after a good rain, when the roots are popping up and they're you know, reaching for the, for the water, that's when you wanna go and, go and get your roots. Uh, grass, you want to go and get grass before it seeds, but when it's uh, nice and tall, about, you know, five to six knuckles high is what they say um, for the grass. And then maidenhair fern, you know, you really want to wait until those are nice and long and have grown out as far as they're going to get. All right, uh, the next couple of questions are slightly related. One of them is, uh, do you teach classes online? <laughs> uh, I have not yet uh, ventured into the world of teaching online. Um, I'm trying to set up a few independent study sessions with some um, with some students, uh, but that has has yet to come to full fruition. Um, I need to kind of figure out this, uh, you know, the where do you put the webcam and then switch it back. You know how to how to do both. Um, you know with how the world is changing right now you know who's to say it won't come soon so i guess you know stay tuned um but uh the next class i will be teaching is over in sitka uh, with the sheldon jackson museum uh, you can go find out on the friends of the sheldon jackson museum facebook page um i believe we start august 
uh, 27th or 28th. <laughs> I really should have those dates down, but the, it was just announced. <laughs> um, so you can go check out the Sheldon Jackson Museum and see when that class is, but we'll be working on a, uh, a small project um, for yourself, along with working on a variety of other projects uh, that'll kind of get you into understanding some of those foundational techniques of weaving. Next question we have is, can you talk about your experiences teaching elementary students how to weave? Okay. So for my elementary students, um, the best thing you have is encouragement. You know, always, always encourage your students. You know, it could be something as simple as changing your wording from, oh, that's the wrong stitch to saying, well, that is a stitch, but that's not the stitch that we're working on right now. You know, changing the, the dialogue, changing the language is really how we need to reach those younger students. You know, encouragement is where everything is. And a lot of times people will get encouragement mixed up with praise. Um, and what I like to really think of is that encouragement puts the judgment on oneself and not somebody else putting judgment on you. Whereas praise is really the judgment of somebody else. Like, oh, you did such a great job. How about you can try and say, wow, you must be so proud of yourself. You know, encouragement is really um, the, the best tool that I have in my arsenal for teaching the young ones. Having an assistant <laughs> is also really great uh, because really weaving is a group activity, but learning it is generally a one-on-one. -on -one. Even when you go into these classes, you know, be patient and understand that your teacher needs to make their time around to you to make sure that you get the weaving technique. So there can be some wait time, but then once you get it, again, the switch is going to flip and your fingers are going to fly. Another question we have regarding teaching is, how does weaving or traditional art translate into mainstream academics? Oh, well, you know, I think my best one is math. <laughs> is weaving is incredibly mathematical. And if somebody thinks that, you know, weaving doesn't, you know, necessarily equate to anything other than art, well, you know, there's a lot of math in there. There's history, there's culture, there's humanities. Um, there's a lot that goes into a basketry class, a lot more than just, you know, how to make the stitches look right. <laughs> I have a, a question that you, you brought up is, so it's more than just um, making it look right, but how long does it take to like design what something is going to look like in your head before you even really start weaving it? It depends on what I'm going to be weaving. Um, something like this basket um, where I'm just doing a simple, you know, I want to have wild strawberry for a few rows and then a potlatch ring and then wild strawberry again. I mean, that decision can be made in a matter of moments. Um, if I'm going to be making something like the five gallon bucket basket, you know, that could take several more days to really think out what am I going to do? But the thing is, you don't want to think out too far because what you are designing it to be and what it's actually wanting to be don't necessarily always line up. And I usually like to let the basket decide what it's going to be in the end. Otherwise, you know, it's, it can be a fight <laughs> and you don't really want to fight um, with your baskets too much while you're trying to create them. So you know, if there's a basket that decides, oh, well, you know, this warp is really working out better for an open weave rather than a compact weave. Well, I guess that's the basket that this one is going to be. And if I want to make a compact weave, then I need to go find a different tree. We had a somewhat similar question earlier, but uh, it might have been before uh, this person joined us today. But is there a dream project that you would like to work on given the time and materials? So I know you mentioned one earlier, but is there like a second one? <laughs> uh, the Well, the dream is really in the, the textiles and textiles stretch across the chill cat, the raven's tail, and not always, you know, kind of overlooked sometimes is the cedar clothing. Um, so, you know, all of those different types of textiles are, they take so much more time um, and so much more energy. And, you know, my, my teacher Dorica talks about how long it took her to make her most recent blanket, um, which was, you know, it, it spanned over more than a decade. Um, but, you know, it just, it's something that I truly aspire to. That's that's when 
I know that all have been able to really reach up into those clouds and, you know, see, hey, this is really, this is really happening. Um, you know, there's a lot to be said for how much you learn in making the larger projects. Um, you know, there are some people who say, oh, well, you know, I made this hat in a couple of days and it's like, oh, well, how much did you put into it though? Like, you know, did you like twine it? Did you compact it? Or did you do open weave? And it's fine to make a hat in a couple of days, but also what more can you make? I really feel like people should be pushing themselves to make, you know, the best thing that they can create, not necessarily just the easiest thing. So the, the harder thing that I really want to make is I, I want to make all three, really. I want to make a chill cat. I want to make a raven's tail. And I'd really, really love to make a cedar cape. Someday. Someday. Um, another question I have is, uh, have you gone after grants or other residencies to help you? In your work? Yes. Uh, so recently, most recently, uh, besides the virtual artist and residency with the Alaska Heritage Institute, I was also accepted to the Sheldon Jackson Museum's uh, Native Artists and Residency Program. And so what that entails is me um, hopping on a plane and going over to Sitka for a few weeks to um, learn from their collection, to demonstrate in their lobby, to teach a workshop and to have a presentation. Um, and that presentation, as far as I know, will be available on Zoom. Um, and so you can all tune in at that time to see what else I have to say about the, the lovely um, corners of weaving. Um, last, last year, oh no, uh, right before the pandemic, um, there's still one kind of in limbo. I was accepted to the, uh, the um, Burke Museum, um, oh my goodness, I'm forgetting, the, the researchers, is that they were going to fly me down uh, to research in their collection, um, but unfortunately the pandemic hit uh, and so I need to schedule that at a later time. So that is still up in the air. So I hope to, again, stay tuned for when I get to go down to the Burke and research some more of their chill cat, of their raven's tail, of their cedar bark, and, you know, all of their different, of their baskets and collections. Uh, all right. Oh, here we go. Uh, just saw your work on display at the Main Street Gallery for the Ketchikan Area Arts and Humanities Council Art Show that opened today. Where else can we find your art on exhibition? Right now, down at Crazy Wolf Studio, I do have one basket on display. The one that I was talking about earlier that just got finished is uh, proudly on display down at Crazy Wolf Studios uh, in downtown Ketchikan. Um, there's also a few roses on display. And then uh, as Jay mentioned earlier, uh, soon coming is the Sea Alaska Heritage Store. will have a display of three of my baskets um, that will be for sale along with an arrangement of earrings and roses. All right, we are just about out of time. So I'm going to say my little outro just in case anybody else puts more questions because there's a little delay. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And thank you, Stacey, for answering our questions. Um, the rest of the videos in this residency will be available on our YouTube on the Sea Alaska Heritage Institute channel sometime in the future. Um, Next week at noon to 1 p.m., Friday, August 13th, we will be talking again um, about different types and styles of Northwest Coast weaving. Now I'm going to give everyone just a second to see if we have any last minute questions. Mm. Nope, we don't. Okay, so. Well, they can tune in next week. <laughs> tune in next week. Uh, can't wait to see you and uh, thank you again. Thank you, Jay. Bye. <laughs>